All right, well, we started a a new series, and uh, it's called Growing with the Giants, and this is part two. Growing with the Giants, part two. Last time we were together, we looked at Adam, and uh, we have to look at Eve. We're going to talk about the man, we got to talk about the man's wife, right? And so here we are talking about Eve this morning. And by way of introduction, let me start by saying this, that we all need to change in our lives. We all need to grow, even in small areas. I've been listening to an audio book uh, on Audible, and I had to buy the book because it used such a, real, such a good illustration, such a tremendous illustration on small changes. So we think about small changes, and small changes can, can make big differences. And, uh, and some of the small changes we think are so insignificant that they just, they're, they're insurmountable. And in our life, as we grow, as we become more like Christ, we need to have more change. And he used this illustration, and I want to read this to you this morning, and I want you to pay close attention. It's about a page and a half, but I think it will, it will do good for an illustration. The the first part is called the fundamentals, why tiny changes make a big difference. So chapter one is the surprising power of atomic habits. Listen carefully. The fate of British cycling changed one day in 2003. The organization which was the governing body for professional cycling in Great Britain had recently hired David Brailsford as a new performance director. At the time, professional cyclists in Great Britain had endured nearly 100 years of mediocrity. Since 1908, British riders had won just a single gold medal in the Olympic Games, and they had fared even worse in cycling's biggest race, the Tour de France. In 110 years, no British cyclist had ever won the event. In fact, the performance of British riders had been so underwhelming that one of the top bike manufacturers in Europe refused to sell bikes to the team because they were afraid that it would hurt sales if other professionals saw the Brits using their gear. Brailsford had been hired to put British cycling on a new trajectory. What made him different from the previous coaches was his relentless commitment to a strategy he called the aggregation of marginal gains, which was the philosophy of searching for tiny margin of improvement in everything you do. Brailsford said, the whole principle came from the idea that if you broke down everything you could think of that goes into riding a bike and then improve it by 1%, you would get a significant increase when you put it all together. Brailsford and his coaches began by making small adjustments you might expect from a professional cycling team. They redesigned the bike seats to make them more comfortable and rubbed alcohol on the tires for a better grip. They asked riders to wear electrically heated overshorts to maintain ideal muscle temperature while riding and used biofeedback sensors to monitor how each athlete responded to a particular workout. The team tested various fabrics in a wind tunnel and had their outdoor riders switch to indoor racing suits, which provided, uh, which proved to be lighter and more aerodynamic. But they didn't stop there. Brailsford and his team continued to find 1% improvements in overlooked and unexpected areas. They tested different types of massage gels to see which one led to the faster muscle recovery. They hired a surgeon to teach each rider the best way to wash their hands to reduce the chances of catching a cold. They determined the type of pillow and mattress that led to the best night's sleep for each rider. They even painted the inside of the team truck white, which helped them spot little bits of dust that would normally slip by, slip by unnoticed, but, all, but could degrade, degrade the performance of the finely tuned bikes. As these and hundreds of other small improvements accumulated, the results came faster than anyone could imagine. Just five years after Brailsford took over, the British cycling team dominated the road and track cycling events in the 2008 Olympic Games in in Beijing, where they won an astounding 60% of the gold medals available. Four years later, when the Olympic Games came to London, the Brits raised the bar as they set nine Olympic records and seven world records. The same year, 
Bradley Wiggins became the first British cyclist to win the Tour de France. The next year, his teammate won the race, and he, won, and he would go on to win again in 2015, 2016, and 2017, giving the British team five Tour de France victories in six years. During the 10-year span from 2007 to 2017, British cyclists won 178 world championships and 66 Olympic and Paralympic gold medals and captured five Tour de France victories in what is widely regarded as the most successful run in cycling history. How did this happen? How did a team previously ordinary, of previously ordinary athletes transform into world championships or champions with tiny changes that at first glance would seem to make a modest difference? Why do small improvements accumulate into such remarkable results, and how can you replicate that in your own life? Small changes, tiny changes, make a big difference. When we look at, the what, uh, at what other people do to accomplish some of the things they accomplish, and we begin to replicate some of their patterns, uh, we are poised for success. When I look across uh, the scripture and I see what we consider giants of the faith, some have done great things, gone on to win great victories and, and uh, procure uh, uh, you know, great territories. And then we say, but there are some of these giants who maybe haven't, haven't fared too well. One of these people is Eve. I mean, if you ask me, I would look at Eve and say, this is treachery. But there's a lot of things we can learn from Eve. We can grow by what she didn't grow by. We can learn things from her. So the first thing I want to talk about is this, essentially this dialogue with the devil that Eve had in Genesis chapter 3. So open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3, and we'll be on our way here into the message. We want to begin by looking at the subtlety of the serpent, the subtlety of the serpent. In Genesis 3, 1 to 3, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. I tell you this morning, friends, that the devil doesn't want you to grow as a Christian. The devil does not want you to grow as a Christian. As a matter of fact, I would would think it's safe to say that the devil is trying to keep every Christian right where he's at. And while I think that growth is a very biblical thing, the, the devil... The devil wants you to be like him, not like God. Remember, we are, we are created to be conformed to the image of Christ. But just remember this, that Satan wanted Christ's throne. He wanted God's throne. So if anything, the devil wants you to be like him. He does not want us to be like God. He does not want us to grow. And there are a lot of implications when I think about this, this lack of growth that a Christian experiences because of the devil. Let me give you one. We say that, well, having more money is a, very, is a very secular thing, is it? Well, I mean, there's a lot of rich people in the Bible. We think of Job was rich, and, and Moses wasn't too bad off, and, and Joseph wasn't, uh, wasn't too bad off either. And we think of David, and Solomon was the richest man in the world. And who gave Solomon his wealth? God. So, well, well but, 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 but having money is a, very, is a very secular thing. Friends, I'm not preaching prosperity, but what I am saying is that God wants you to be well off in most cases because if you're well off as a Christian, a 10% of 100 is better than 10% of 10. And so we give our money, and if we are growing as a, Christians, it mean, a Christian, it means that we can give to a worthy work. It means that we can give to a church or charity, Right? We can help people in need. Proverbs 19, 17 says this, He that hath pity on the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. How can we give to the Lord's work if we're broke? How can we give to the Lord's work if we're broke? I don't think having money should be the climax of our life, but I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to have wealth. And if the devil can keep you right where you're at, 
financially so that you cannot give to the Lord's work, well, then, then the devil's doing his, his deed, isn't he? Because the goal is, is if we do want to grow as a Christian, and then we do grow in our wealth, we give that money back to the Lord's work, and then the Lord is better off, right? But one thing the devil's trying to do, he's trying to keep you where you're at financially. I don't think financial goals are bad goals. They're not worldly goals. I don't think the Lord wants you to be in debt. How do you serve two masters, right? It's impossible. Well, having healthy habits is another way, another implication. We want to have good habits, growing habits as a Christian. The devil wants, doesn't want you to have healthy habits. But healthy habits means doing more worthy deeds. If you have healthy habits, if you are eating well, if you are exercising well, if you are doing the things that a Christian ought to be doing to take care of his body, can I say this this morning, that that is a, a good thing, and that is something that God would want. But the devil doesn't want that. The, the devil wants you to eat another Twinkie. It's just true. <laughs> the devil doesn't want you to carve out time to take care of the body that God has given you. He wants you to fall apart. Just like I had said before, how can you do more work if you're broke? How can you do more work if you're broken? When I get to a ripe old age, I would like to be able to be physically fit enough to be able to continue to do the Lord's work. I'd like to be able to get there with, with money as well. So we can't do the Lord's work if we're broke, and we can't do the Lord's work if we're broken. One of the devil's devices is he wants to keep the sinner sinning. He wants to keep you right where you're at. The devil doesn't want you to grow as a Christian. He wants you to be stagnant. The serpent wants stagnant servants. That's what he wants. He wants you to remain just where you are. So the subtle tendency of the serpent is to keep the sinner sinning by not growing, by not growing. So growth is a positive thing. We, we, we look at this and we say, well, but there's a lot of, a lot of New Year's resolutions that are just, um, you know, very secular. And I say, you know what, I, I, I actually, I encourage people to be resolved. And not just every year, not just once a month or once a week, but once a day. Do not make some resolutions when you get up in the morning. Hopefully your resolutions are positive. Hopefully the things that you're trying to attain honor God and they're not trying to just fill your own pockets. Hopefully you're, you're trying to, uh, to, to lose weight, maybe, maybe uh, feel better, try to you know, exercise your muscles, try to, get, try to get in better shape. Not so you can look good and, and become, uh, all is vanity, right? But hopefully you're trying to say, hey, you know what? I got to make sure that my body stays in the best shape it can be for as long as it can be so I can keep doing the work of the Lord as long as I can do it. I don't think those are bad goals. I don't think those are bad goals. I don't think church goals are bad goals. To have more people means to do more ministry because ministry is about people. I don't think, and I said this uh, uh, several weeks ago, I don't think having educational goals is bad. And just like I said, I said, ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is a bad testimony. I don't think God wants us to be just stupid. I think God wants us to sharpen our sword, to know his word, to preach it declaratively, to love people, to, to love a lot of people. God wants us to grow in so many areas. Now, if you notice here in verse 1, we see the menace testing Eve's memory. The serpent was subtly misleading her with a little bit of truth. In partial, the Lord did say in Genesis 2.16, of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. But listen, the serpent was subtly selective in his verses, wasn't he? He did not tell the whole verse. He only gave part of the verse. He wanted you to only have a little bit of the truth. But having the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth leads you to tremendous triumph. If we only have a little bit of truth... Mixed in with a lot of bit of error, we're going to end up on the wrong side of things, aren't we? And you know what? That's exactly what the serpent was trying to do. He was trying to blend a little bit of truth with a lot of error. One commentator said this, Even so, there was no reason uh, why Eve should have fallen so swiftly into Satan's snare. She had the 
one weapon he feared, the word of God. Her Bible was very small, consisting of just two verses. Isn't that amazing? That, however, would have been enough. But even one word from God, believed and obeyed, as a mighty sword in need. But look at what happened from the beginning. Eve was clumsy in her use of her sword. She used it, it is true, but she misused it. She misquoted it once, subtracted from it twice, and added to it once. Did she think she could paraphrase it and improve it? Did she imagine that as long as she had the the general drift of God's thoughts in mind, the actual words did not matter, end quote? How important is it to us as Christians to grow in our understanding of God's word? Well, it should be imperative. If you want to grow, you have to know God's word. You have to know God's word because you know what the devil's going to do? He's going to come in and he's going to he's going to subtly try to only give you a little bit here and there and then he's going to mix in a lot of error and try to sweep us into a different path. If we want to grow as Christians, we have to know God's word. The devil is deliberately trying to deceive you through your disregard for his truth. If you want to grow as a Christian, we have to know God's word. Let's look secondly at the suggestions of the serpent. The suggestions of the serpent in Genesis 3, 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Ye shall not surely die. The input of others, the input of others may not seem all that bad. It it amazes me how how we just take the input of, of, of the secular world and uh, we, we apply it to our lives, but really there is a truth between, a difference between wise counsel and unwise counsel. And we need to know the difference. The Bible says to attend to wise counsel, Proverbs 4.13, take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. The instruction you have with wise counsel is going to be your life. That's your survival that should be in your little, your little survival kit. should be your Bible. That is your life. Proverbs 15, 32, He that refuseth instruction despises, despises his own soul, but he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. Are you listening to God's word? Are you, are you taking in wise counsel? We had a, a great example from Samuel today uh, in, in, uh, in Sunday school about taking in wise counsel. And it fared very well, didn't it? He was way better off by taking wise counsel than by unwise counsel. Unwise counsel, uh, Psalm 1.1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't follow ungodly people with their ungodly deeds. As a matter of fact, in, in Proverbs 1.15, with regard to following people who are, who are sinners, it says, My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. You know what this says to me? Don't even put your foot on the path. You know, if you put your foot in the front door, the chances of you going into the house are probably pretty good. You know what Proverbs is saying here? Solomon is saying, don't put your foot in the front door. Don't put it on the stoop. Don't put it on the step that leads to the stoop. Don't put it on the sidewalk. Don't put it in the yard. Don't put it in the driveway. Don't even put your foot in the street. Because when you put your foot in the street, the chances of getting in the driveway are pretty good. Don't put your foot in the path of unwise counsel. Stay away from it. Don't listen to it. Don't heed to it. You're going to heed to more counsel, more unwise counsel, the more you listen to it. So when you surround yourself with friends that are unwise and they're giving you unwise counsel, the chances of you listening to that are probably pretty good. So he's saying stay away from that. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. You're not going to walk in the counsel of the ungodly if you're not in the way of the ungodly. Stay away from them. We need to know the difference between wise counsel and unwise counsel. And here the suggestion of the serpent is very interesting to me. It's very interesting to me. The suggestions of many other people might seem, they might seem harmless. They might even seem heartfelt. The suggestions that other people offer you, but to be honest with you, a lot of them are just downright hurtful. There are things, there, 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 there are things that people say to you, 
And, and basically, they are trying to get you not to grow. Here's a couple of them. Listen to this. Have you ever heard this one before? Uh, don't work so hard. Now, you, you tell me where that's in the Bible. And say, oh, you don't, you don't have to work so hard. Really? Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do with all thy might. That's in the Bible too. Right? Everything you do, do as, as unto the Lord. If anything, what you'll find is you'll find the example of Christ and of God who did tremendous amount of work. And you know what? There's parallels here where, where God is saying, keep working. Keep working. And when you work, work hard. Find something to do and then do it as unto the Lord. The suggestions that other people offer, you know what? They're not, they're not helping you to grow. This suggestion of don't work so hard, that's not a growth perspective. Here's another one. How about this? Uh, don't be so hard on yourself. We hear that, right? Well, you don't have to be so hard on yourself. Well, friends, can I tell you that what the Bible says? The Bible says that we need to examine ourselves. The Bible says that if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged, right? So the goal is, is to look at what I can change in my life and then change it. Don't be so hard on yourself. Don't you, you kick yourself when you're down. Let me tell you something. Every day should be evaluating what you're doing. You should be, you should be evaluating. Was this beneficial? Was it not? It, it, does this glorify God or does it not? Am I, am I walking in a right relationship with God or am I not? And just to say, oh, don't be so hard on yourself. Uh, take it easy. Your sin's no big deal. You, you don't have to get right with God. I mean, come on. All you got to do is just, you, you'll be fine. And, and the same people who say, you don't have to work so hard and don't be so hard on yourself, they're the same ones that say, you don't have to be in church today. You don't have to read your Bible. But in a sense, listen to what they're saying. They're saying, don't grow. You don't have to worry about growth. Here's another, here's another one. Don't be so serious. Now, I, 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 can, I can have a good joke as, I mean, I love, I love kidding around. If you're part of my staff, you know. I mean, I love laughing. I know funny. I'm a pastor. I love joking. I love, at times, not being so serious. But I'd venture to guess that if the Messiah stood before us right now in the middle of this room, we'd all be serious. I'd venture to guess that the disciples, though they had their time of laughing and kidding, I bet they took their ministry very seriously. I bet those disciples that were there with the Lord, they weren't casual with it. Now, they weren't as serious as what they could have been. And after the resurrection in the book of Acts, we see a whole new level of seriousness taking place, don't we? We see them winning the world because now they realize it's time to be serious. I'm not saying we can't laugh and have a good time. I enjoy that sort, of, that sort of stuff. But we just need to be careful of the suggestions that other people offer. You're fine where you're at. Oh, come on. Here's what the serpent says. You shall not truly really die. You're going to die from one Twinkie. I mean, come on. Unless you choke on a Twinkie, which is very possible. If you've eaten a Twinkie lately, just you literally, you have to choke it down. I mean, that in itself says you're choking. Oh, come on, you, 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 you're not going uh, it's, it's to, just, it's just, it's just one, one sip of alcohol. It's just one day of missing your church. It's just one day of missing prayer. Don't, you don't have to, you know, come on, here, let's just, you're fine where you're at. That's a great suggestion. You're doing good, you're fine where you're at. You don't need improvement. Come on, we don't all need to grow. You're working too hard, you're being too serious. We need to be careful that these suggestions are like the serpent that says, you're not going to die. You'll be all right. It's just a little speeding. Every area of our lives can use at least marginal gains. Every area of our life can use at least marginal gains. Proverbs 10, 4 says, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Are you going to deal with a slack hand? Are you going to go out there and you're going to go out there and you're going to slay the dragon? Or are you going to say, no, 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 that's someone else's job. <laughs> it's too serious for me. It's too much work. I've been told by my, my friends that, that I work too much, so I'm going to take a little time off and just kind of kick back and relax. Or are you going to get out there and you're going to go out there and kill the dragon? Well, hopefully you're going to be one of those. The suggestions of the serpent can be very, very tough. 
So you have to be careful of those. Look at the suppositions of the serpent, the supposition of the serpent. Genesis 3, 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, this is interesting, because the supposition here is based on a lack of subordination. That God's ways are, are not as good as, as what he is telling you. It's a lack of subordination, that, 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 that I'm, not going to be, I'm not going to be put underneath God. My ways are probably going to be better than God's ways. Isaiah 55, 8, 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are, are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, friends, we have to, we have to take hold of this truth and say that, that God wants you to grow as a Christian because growth is biblical. Growth is paramount. If you want to make it through life and you want to honor God, you have to grow in so many areas and not just say, hey, 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 hey. Let's just say, you know, we made a New Year's resolution back in 2005. I mean, that was a big deal, you know? I mean, I did some really hard things, and maybe you did. But you know what? We should be making resolutions in 2006 and 2008 and yesterday and today. Because God wants us to grow in so many areas. Let me just give you a few of them. In our health, Matthew 10, 8, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely have received, freely give. This is interesting to me because uh, I think God wants us to be of good health. Now, sometimes God allows us to be of bad health by his making. No different than we see in John chapter 9 with the blind man. Why was this man blind? Was he, why was he born blind? Was it his, what his sin or his parents' sin? And, and, of course, we know the Lord said that the works of God may be manifest in him. Sometimes we are ill. Sometimes we are sick. I, didn't, I don't control the fact that I have lupus, but at the same time, I control whether or not I intake a bunch of junk food and then beat my body down, right? I think the Lord had a, had a heart for healthy people. Can you imagine? This is the first call for the disciples. I want you to go out there. I want you to heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. I mean, I want you to, I want you to help restore people. I think restoration, health is, is of the Lord. I think he wants us there. I think uh, wealth is, is not necessarily a bad thing. Proverbs 13, 11. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. I, I think if you're out there laboring to be rich, the Bible says labor not to be rich, Cease from thine own wisdom. We shouldn't be out there working to be wealthy. We should be out there working because it's what God has us to do. And you know what? If we're out there doing what God has us to do, we're going to be wealthy. I mean, we might not be Bill Gates wealthy. We might not be Jeff Bezos wealthy. But we'll be better off than if we're out there squandering. Strength, Isaiah 40, 29, he giveth strength to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Wisdom. All we got to do is ask for that. James 1, 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. We should be soul conscious, right? We should be out there winning souls because the Bible says that he that winneth souls is wise. The one thing that Jesus came to this earth to do, many of us don't do. He says here in Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And you know what? There's a lot of Christians out there who don't evangelize. They don't hand out heaven tracts. They're not out there knocking on doors. They're not out there making phone calls. They're not out there looking around at every individual as a lost soul that could spend an eternity in hell. We need to be growing in our souls. We need to be soul conscious, right? This one just spells it out in 2 Peter 3.18 that we need to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So many times in the Bible is, there a, is it promoted to grow. Don't be the same person that you used to be. Don't be lukewarm. The church of Laodicea, was. he said, I would rather have you hot or cold, but not lukewarm. Don't be just a mediocre Christian. That's what he's saying. And how many times do we, we set a, a, a maybe like a little goal, like, okay, I'm just going to get a little bit better, and, and then just that's it. Or, or hey, I, I don't mind being average. I'm just okay the way I am. And you know what the subtlety of Satan is doing? He's saying, be content with such things as you have. But you know what? While that's true, that's a subtlety. Because what, what the devil leaves out is a tremendous amount of other verses that says, grow. 
Don't be the same person. You got to be a better husband. You got to be a better father. Be a better Christian. Be a better churchgoer. Be a better employer, employee. Be better, 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 better. Good, better, best. Don't let it rest until your good is your better and your better is your best. We need to strive for mastery. That's what the Bible says. Growth is, is biblical. Anybody who says, well, we're just happy with where we're at educationally, physically, emotionally, financially, we're just, we're just okay, is not helping you. The people that are helping you are the ones getting behind you saying, hey, let's go. Let's run the race. Let's do better than we did yesterday. Uh, we, need to, we need to do better. They'll say, whoa, whoa, whoa I'm 60. I'm 70. Good, set some goals for the next 10 years. Don't give up. You got to keep plodding along, keep running the race. Growth is biblical. And let me say this in conclusion. If, in fact, growth is biblical, then you need to grow. So we have to have a starting point somewhere. Where do we start growing? Well, this is a great Bible verse in Luke 17, 5. Listen to what the apostles said to the Lord. The apostles said unto the Lord, increase, that means grow, our faith. How many of you in this room right now can say, you know what, I pray for increased faith. I want to have more faith. I want to be more faithful. I, I, I want to know my Savior. I want to know my Lord, and I want to grow. I don't want to be the same guy that I was two weeks ago. I don't want to be the same husband that I was four years ago. I hope that my wife can say my husband's growing. I hope my kids can say my, my, my daddy's growing. Not this way, you know. My daddy is growing this way, but I hope they say, man, I'm just so glad that, 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 that my dad has a vision for the church and a vision for souls. And, and, and I, just, I just am so glad that, that uh, hopefully my wife says, I'm so glad my husband loves me so much that, that he is continually trying to strive for the mastery. I have these conversations with, um, with my staff. We had a CPA come in the other day, and I was kind of vetting him. And he had uh, 35 years of experience. I asked him some very basic, rudimentary questions. And uh, I have three of my staff that are here today that would testify to this, this dialogue that took place. The guy was clueless. I will not recommend this guy. And I asked him some very basic questions. And I'm not saying I knew more than him. But I'm saying I probably knew more than him in some areas. And when he left, I turned to my staff and I said, that was not worth $100 to me. <laughs> I said, that wasn't worth it. I said, this is crazy. And I said, you know what happened? Here's what happened. 35 years ago, he graduated from school. And he learned some basic principles, or maybe even mastered some principles, about, about uh, uh, accounting. And you know what? He probably hasn't read a book since. Because he's decided that he, he attained it all, and he doesn't need to grow. And there's some Christians that say, well, I got saved. And, and I've been reading my Bible, and I've been going to church maybe, maybe once a month, once a week, and, and, but that's about all that I can handle at this point. I don't need to grow. And you have the apostles here in Luke 17 that says, Lord, increase our faith. Help us to grow. Help us to work hard. Help us to be healthy. Help us to be wealthy. I use that one next to it because it rhymes. Help us, Lord, to grow in grace. We have to be careful. We have to be careful of the subtlety of the serpent. Because he's trying to get you to stay exactly where you're at. Mediocre. He wants Pastor Joe to stay right where he's at. Mediocre. He doesn't want Pastor Joe to have a better relationship with his wife. He doesn't want Pastor Joe to have a better relationship with his kids or a better relationship with you. He doesn't want Pastor Joe to cast vision that increases our faith, that stretches his church. He doesn't want Pastor Joe to work hard, to get smarter, because getting smarter would just simply mean that, that there's going to be a growing disparity between the lack of the serpent and, and, and the, the wonder of the Savior. So God 
wants us to grow, and the serpent, through his subtlety, wants you to remain exactly where you're at. So we have to be careful of the subtlety, the suggestions, and now the supposition. We need to pray that the Lord will increase our faith. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you don't have any faith in God, then that is a wonderful starting point. It's a wonderful starting point where you can say, I know for sure where I'm going when I die. But remember, this is the starting point. This is, this is the genesis of your faith. This is where it begins. This isn't where it ends. Your faith will continue to grow the more that you ask God for that. Like the apostles, like in James 1, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Say, Lord, I want to increase my wisdom. Faith at this moment is the starting point for you, but it's not the finish line. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I want to share an illustration with you. I want this hand right here to represent you and me, and I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says that we all have this sin. A lot of churches would say, well, if you repent and turn over a new leaf, turn over a new leaf in your life, uh, you'll be better. But the problem is, is you still have your sin. They say, uh, they say, well, if you get water baptized, the problem is you get water baptized till your skin turns pruny. You still have this sin. You can come to church. You can give money to church. You can be a member of a church. You can help build the church physically. And you know what? You still have your sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is, is death. The wages of sin is not church membership. The wages of sin is not living a good life. The wages of sin is not water baptism or giving money to the church or praying a prayer. The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die for this sin. Someone has to make the payment. Now, you can make the payment and spend an eternity separated from God because you are not going to be with God in heaven, which is sinless, if you have to pay for the sin. The only other option you have is to trust in someone else's death. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to this earth to die on the cross for your sin, right? The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die. I want this hand, and I mean it reverently to represent the Lord Jesus. He came to this earth 2,000 years ago to die on the cross for your sin. The Bible says it's not by works of righteousness which you have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. If we could live a good enough life that we could go to heaven, then why would Jesus have to come to this earth to die? It's all because he loved us so much, he gave his son for us, and he said that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Isn't that a wonderful starting point of faith when you place your faith in Christ as your Savior? It's not because of something you've done. It's something that Jesus Christ has done for you. So if you've never done that today, right now in your seat, you can trust Christ as your Savior. It's not about walking an aisle or praying a prayer or raising a hand or coming to church or getting baptized. The wages of sin is death. When we trust that Jesus' death on the cross was sufficient for our sins, he gives us eternal life.